Lord, it's our privilege to lift up your name this morning. We do exalt you as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the lover of our souls. And Lord, we recognize that your streams of mercy have washed over us. We know the past that we have behind us. And you have wiped that away as far as the east is from the west. You have shown us mercy. We know the troubles that we have now. We know our failings and our weaknesses. And your stream of mercy still flows. It still impacts our life. It impacts our families. We have your power flowing through us. And we're thankful people. And so, Lord, we do return our worship to you. Saying that you are our God. You are our King. You are our Lord. We submit our life to you. And we're thankful, thankful, thankful. You are holy, holy, holy. And we are grateful to be your people. So, Lord, won't you be in the rest of our service today? Help us to honor you in a new way. Help us to honor you with all of our hearts and with all of our strength and all of our mind as we look at your word. Help us. We need your help. And we pray all these things in the powerful, awesome, loving name of Jesus the Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. Hey, it's great to be with you guys today, and we do have a few announcements, a couple of things coming up that you want to know about. we got a corn maze on the 19th. If we go into that, we actually need you to sign up in the back. There's a, a sign-up booth right in the back. We need you to do that. also want to let you know that every Monday evening at 6 o'clock, we gather here to pray for our church. Most of you know that we're in a time of transition. And we got some things that we're not sure what the Lord's going to do, but we know He's going to do something. And so we're praying that He is going to show Himself powerful on our behalf. And so if you want to come and pray with us, we've had some great times. We ask you to come. Also, you'll notice in your worship folder, there's a few things happening in the church where you can get connected to a life group or a, a, a class where you can learn some really cool things. If you want to look through there, Get yourself connected to the church. We'd love to see you be a, just a firm part of the body. So, hey, um, I'm going to ask that our ushers come forward. As they come, if the kids, you guys can be dismissed now and head back to fun time while the rest of us have a boring time, right? <laughs> so we're glad that the kids are here. And so as our ushers come forward, I do want to welcome anybody who's here visiting with us today. We're so glad you guys have made it a point to come and worship with us. We hope that you've sensed the presence of the Lord and that you'll be blessed by what happens here today. You've blessed us by coming. We thank you for that. And this is a time now where, we, where we're going to offer our, our offerings back to the Lord. If you're visiting with us today, we don't expect you to participate in that. Our gift to you is this service. We hope that blesses you and that it's a good thing in your life. This is a time where those of us who are part of this church commit to the ministry. And we got some great things happening here. We've got lots of things going on, but we've got life happening in our hearts. And that's what we celebrate today. So we're going to take our offering here. Thank you guys for doing that. Let me pray for it. Lord, thanks for the work that you're doing here at New Heights. We ask that you would be the completer of that. We ask that you would take all the things that we offer on, in service to you, our time and our talents and our money, we ask that you would take that, multiply it in such an incredible way that your kingdom is impacted, that that world is changed, that people come to faith, and that our church is a vibrant representation of the bride of Christ. If that's what we want, Lord, we ask that you would be our helper now, in Jesus' name. Okay, so we got a really cool service this morning. I hope you guys have felt the presence of the Lord here. I have. It's been a great 
we're going to, we got our regular message, and then we're going to take communion after. So we got a really good opportunity here to connect with the Lord. Today we're going to finish the book of 1 Peter. We've been walking through that week by week, one chapter a week. Have you enjoyed walking through the book? Amen. Yeah. Okay, me too. I enjoyed it so much last week, I decided to come back this week. So um, you guys have been reading every week, going through the chapter, and we got a final exam today. All right, you guys ready for that? No, okay. No, no exam, but I hope that you've taken some time in it. And Peter now is wrapping up the letter, and you can almost feel the intensity building in him. Our primary focus today is going to be on chapter on verse 5 through 11. But to get you some context, we're going to go back to the first of the chapter. And we're going to see Peter make an appeal. He's making a personal, forceful call to the church here. And first, he addresses pastors and elders. He says this, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder... And a witness of Christ's suffering who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. Watching over them. Not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears... You will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So Peter here, you can feel his urgency as he's talking to these people. He knows that his time is short. We learn that just a little bit later in 2 Peter. He knows that his time is short. And his primary objective is to see that the church is healthy. It has to be healthy. Because the people that were eyewitnesses to Jesus... These people are dying off. Actually, they're being martyred. And so, if the power of the gospel is going to continue to be represented in this world, it's going to be up to the church to do that. And in order for the church to do that, it's got to be healthy, right? It's got to be healthy. And it's got to have healthy leaders. And so he starts with that, healthy leaders. He said, these are people who are eager for the work. These are diligent people. These are not slackers. These are people that are working hard. They're caring shepherds. And you know what that means. They're not greedy for their own gain. They've got the gain of the kingdom in mind. And they have a servant's heart. He said, this is the kind of pastor that God's church must have. But the pastor is only a part of the equation. For the church to be healthy, not only must the leader be healthy, but the body has to be healthy also. And so in the rest of the chapter, Peter spends his time talking about a healthy body, a mature body of Christ. And he uses more verses to talk about the body than he does to talk about the leader. And that's what we're going to look at today is what does it mean to be a mature Christian? What does it mean to be healthy as a body of believers individually and as a whole? Okay, so that's where we're going. It's going to be 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. If you'd stand with me to honor the word and I'll read it. Lord, help us as we read to honor your word. We say it is true. Amen. So in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. 
and the God of all grace who called you into his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So as we read through this, it's easy to see that Peter is appealing to the people of God to be a certain kind of person. Just like he appealed to the leaders in verse 1 to 4, now he appeals to the body to show maturity in their faith. And he works through a list of characteristics that are easy to pick out there. The first one we see is submission. Submission. In verse 5 he says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. He says, in the same way to start that out, linking it back with verses 1 to 4, where he's encouraging pastors to submit to the chief shepherd, he calls him, the Lord. Pastors, you submit to the chief shepherd. Likewise, in the same way, just like the pastors are submitting to Christ, likewise, you submit to your elders. Submit. And that's not old people. That is, why do I point at myself when I say, well, old people? All right, I need to find somebody else to point at. Yeah, Bob, there you go. <laughs> submit to your elders. Submit to the spiritual leadership that God has placed over you in your church. And yet you notice there that he, he calls this out to young men. Now, I wonder why he singles out young men for this teaching. About half of us have been young men. And we can say, well, that's probably pretty smart. And a lot more of us have had teenage kids. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> but, so we know that young men tend to, tend to be rambunctious, headstrong, hard to lead maybe. And so he singles them out as saying that, but he uses them really as an example, not as an exclusive. He doesn't exempt the rest of us from this. He addresses young men because they are most likely to need the instruction, but all of us need that. It applies to every one of us. The word he uses for submit here is, is a Greek word, hupotasso, which means nothing to us, right? But to them, it was what they would have known from a military exercise. It means to line up under someone else. So any of you that have been in the military or any service, you would know what that means. What does it mean to line up under the command of an officer? The officer has earned his stripes, knows his job, is worthy of respect. And the soldiers line up under trusting that officer to lead well. So it's a willingness to place ourselves under the authority of, of another person. And earlier in 1 Peter, he uses this same word, this hupotasso, to talk about other types of submission. He talks about submitting to civil authority. He talked about being submissive to our employers. And even in the marriage relationship, it's the same word, is to willing, willingly submit ourselves to authority. And here in verse 5, he uses it to talk about submitting to, to spiritual leadership. But not just any spiritual leadership. Leadership like what he said in verse 1 to 4. We submit to godly leadership. We trust them. Honor them. We follow their leadership. And we don't cause them difficulty. We're not unruly sheep, you might say. Hebrews 13, 17 says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be no benefit to you. So we submit to our leadership. That's the first mark of mature Christianity is that we know how to submit ourselves to the leadership that God's placed over us. Not chafing at it, not subtly resisting, but willing submission 
to godly leadership. So that's the first characteristic, submission. The second one is humility. Humility. He says in verse 5 and in, and in part of 6, All of you, clothe yourself with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. So he says, all of you, this is not the young men, this is all of you, in case somebody was hoping to be exempted from this part, he says, no, this is all of you, clothe yourself with humility. And that phrase, clothe yourself, paints a word picture for us. In Greek, it's a single word, and it's the word for donning a work garment. So it would have been like them putting on an apron they would have used this same word that he's saying here, this, this word for clothe yourself. So the idea is, if you want to be effective in the work of the kingdom, you need to have on the right work clothes. You need to put on the apron of humility, clothes of humility. The literal translation of humility is a lowliness of mind, not thinking of ourselves as better than somebody else. Not valuing our opinions more highly than we do someone else's. Not valuing our time more than theirs or our talents more than theirs or the work that we've done as being somehow more valuable to the kingdom. We have a lowliness of mind. I wonder when Peter wrote this, when he talked about clothing yourself with humility. I wonder if he thought about the time that Jesus put on a different garment. John chapter 13. Jesus got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing. And he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Simon replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus said, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, he returned to his place, he said, do you understand what I have done? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I say to you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So Jesus, did you hear Jesus say to Peter, you'll understand this later. Well, we understand here from 1 Peter, he understands it now. He got it. He says, humble yourself, clothe yourself in humility. This is a defining mark of a Christ follower. Then Peter gives us the motivation for being a humble spirit because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Now this is a quote, direct quote, from Proverbs 3.34. You want grace poured out in your life? Humble yourself, clothe yourself with humility. Because ultimately we know we're humbling ourselves before God. He is the one. You guys got flies in your house? I just, I just caught them. Okay. <laughs> ultimately, so we humble ourselves before God's mighty hand. He put us in the situation we're in. He knows our boss. He knows our president. He knows our candidates. He knows our pastor. 
He knows our spouse and our kids and our friends. He knows this. He has you right where he wants you. And Peter self says, humble yourself under his mighty hand. Don't chafe at it. His mighty hand is sovereign. He leads us beside the still waters. And then he takes our hand and he walks us through the valley. His hand is sovereign. He gives us good times and he gives us difficulty. Don't fight it. Don't run from it. Don't avoid it. Don't pretend it's not really happening. Humble yourself under his mighty hand. Acknowledge that the hand of the Lord is at work in your life. Because in due time, He will lift you up. Isn't that good news? He will lift you up. And when Peter says in due time, he's not talking about when we all get to heaven. This is a present life due time. He's talking about God's timing for lifting our spirits and lightening our load. He wants us to have good days. Remember that from... 1 Peter chapter 3, you want to see good days? Same thing here. He wants us to have good days, but He also wants to grow us up. And that often involves challenges. Growing pains, you might say. He gives grace to the humble. And then we see trust as a mark of of, uh, maturity. Trust. A mature Christian trusts God. Cast all of your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Peter's paraphrasing from Psalm 55 here, actually. And in that Psalm, King David is crying out to God. His friends have deserted him. His enemies are after him. Society's falling apart around him. The city that he's responsible for is just in deplorable condition. And he cries out to God in Psalm 55. Listen to what he said. Listen to my prayer, O God. Please do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me and I am distraught because of what my enemy is saying. For they bring down suffering on me. They assail me in their anger. Verse 9, Lord, confuse the wicked. Confound their words. For I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they prowl about on its walls. Malice and abuse are within it. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave its streets. Isn't that something familiar? If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising, I could hide. But it is a man like myself. He was a companion, a close friend. And we walk together in worship. And then verse 20. When a companion attacks his friends, he violates his covenant. His talk is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. But verse 22. Cast your cares on the Lord. He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. So anybody here feel some weight like David was feeling? Friends deserting us? Society in trouble? Difficulties on all sides? He says, cast your anxiety on him. And this is a very descriptive way to talk about it. He says, cast, it's the same word that they used. When, remember when they had the foal of a donkey that Jesus was going to ride into Jerusalem on? And they took the cloaks off and they put them on the donkey. And it's the same word here for casting our our anxieties. Is that same word for when they cast their cloaks onto this donkey. Is they put the full weight of that onto the donkey. Peter says, take them off. Cast them off. He'll carry the weight of them. Why? Why wouldn't you let him do that? He says, cast them off. It's not like casting a fishing line where we cast it, but we still got it, right? And we're going to reel it right back in and own it again. He says, no, cast them. Put them off. Put them on something else. 
He cares for you. That's why he does that. Because he cares. Did you notice that we cast our anxiety on him? The circumstances might remain. But the anxiety of them, he can carry. We might still have those circumstances. We probably will have some difficulty. He promised us we would. But the anxiety of it, the worry of it, the thing that gnaws in our stomach, that's something we can place on Him. Why? Because this is the mighty hand of God we're talking about. He's able to handle that. He's able to ensure that these things do not destroy us. He can carry the anxiety load for us. Hallelujah for that, right? Yeah. You can trust him. You can trust him. And next, he says, be self-controlled. Literally, it's be sober-minded. The mature believer resists the intoxicating allurements and attractions of this world. We need a mind that's not caught up in all this stuff that's coming at us. But it's free to focus on the things of God. When you're drunk with something, you're not able to think about the right things in life. And that's what he's saying. That's the word he's using here. Don't get drunk with what the world's feeding you. Because then your mind is not able to submit to God and and to focus on his principles for your life. Be self-controlled, sober-minded. And then he says, be alert. Be alert because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We have an enemy, folks, an adversary. He is relentless. He's like a hungry lion looking for food. Get that in your mind. Not going to give up. And Peter says he's not just an enemy. He says he's your enemy. His intention is to destroy you and your family. His mission's always been destruction. He tried to destroy Jesus. Remember? With Herod. Tried to destroy him when he was a baby. In the desert. He tried to distract Jesus with temptation. And at the end of Jesus' life, he tried to destroy him even with death. But he couldn't do it. He tried to destroy Jesus. And we see another example of that is what what Satan is doing to the nation of Israel all through their history. He's been after Israel. The whole world has come against them time and time again. People have tried to wipe out Israel from the map. And even today... Their enemies are surrounding them, firing rockets into them. The world is ostracizing them. The the tide of public opinion is against them. That's Satan's work, trying to destroy the people of God. That's what it is. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem because God is not finished with the Jewish people. He wants to save them. So we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and we say His mighty hand can deliver them. We know Satan's after them, but we're going to pray that God sustains them. So that's our enemy. He is powerful. He's destructive. We must be alert, steadfast, watching for His schemes. And we know His schemes. His schemes come in all kinds of different ways. A few of them are that, that you'll recognize. One is Temptation. We know that. That's one of his schemes. He tries to use the allurement of the world, the power, the money, whatever it happens to be, to destroy us. Be on the alert. These are traps. He knows that if he can get you to take a bite of the apple, he's got a good chance of pulling you in, into a sinful pattern. And then that sinful pattern pulls us away from God. It trashes our life makes us pretty much ineffective for use in the kingdom. Be on the alert because this is what he's trying to do. 
And he's trying to pull us away. Be on the alert. He also tries to destroy our families, marriages. He can use a family situation to cause discouragement, discontentment, despair. He can use this. He will even try to cause dissension in a marriage and tempt us to be unfaithful. He will do this. In fact, Paul wrote about that. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verse 2 to 5. He says, since sexual immorality is rampant, each man should have relations with his wife, each woman with her husband. The husband should fulfill the marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to the husband. The wife does not have authority over her body, but yields it to the husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his body, but yields to the wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Can you believe I just said that in church? This is biblical, folks. He will try to tempt us. We have to be alert for that. Satan will try to attack us through temptation. And in our closest relationships, he'll even try to attack us in the church. And he can be scheming. He tries to create dissension and disunity within the body. He loves it when you when he hears the word church split. He loves that. This is what he's trying to do. And it's very dangerous. Be on the alert for that. He'll try to subtly sneak in somebody that creates problems. He'll try to subtly sneak in a teacher that's teaching false doctrine to pull you away from truth. Subtly, he'll do it. He is a powerful enemy. And he wants to create disunity. You know what? I was so proud of our church last Sunday. There was a, a great sense of unity that you can feel. And you guys know that we voted about our future, and I'm happy to report the vote was unanimous. Well over half the people that call this their church home voted. That's a good result. Everyone said, yes, that's our future. And so we're going with it. And we're going to trust God for what he has for us. Yeah, he, the devil wants to create disunity. We serve a God of unity. And that's who we are. So also, we stand firm. That's the next one. Stand firm. We resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And so this is a call to put up resistance against the enemy, to stand firm, to not be moved by temptation, to not sin in our disappointment and discouragement, to not believe the lies of the enemy. We stand firm in the faith. He said, stand firm in the faith. And when he says the faith there, he's talking about the whole doctrine of God and Christianity. Stand firm in it. We need to know it. We need to be able to distinguish truth from error. We need to be able to recognize these subtle lies that slip in. We have to know our stuff so that we know when to resist. Last month in the plant, I'm, for those of you who don't know, I work in a factory. And so in the plant last month, we had one of our numbers came in, and it was terrible. It was like, well, this is a disaster. What happened? One of our key areas had really poor performance, and it didn't make sense to me. So I asked for the numbers to be checked, and so they got, they got them checked. The report came back. Oh, yeah, everything checked out just perfect. But it still didn't feel right to me. Something, I just knew something was wrong. I was around all month. I'd been watching. I understood. I could kind of feel it, what was happening. And so I said, I'm going to check this out myself. So I went through the numbers, and I found a massive mistake. It was so massive that it turned our number from being bad to actually being good. And so I'm a numbers person, and I spend a lot of time out in the plant. And so I've got this intuitive feel for how things are happening out there. 
And when I see a number, I can correlate that with how it felt. You know what I mean? Some of you guys are, can, can understand that. When you're really intuitive with something, when you're really deep in it, you get a feeling if, if this is right or wrong. And so I knew that number can't be right. And so I had such a strong feeling, I checked it out and made sure. And sure enough, it was wrong. And that's the way we should be with our faith. We should have such an intimate understanding of who God is and what He wants from us that when we hear something that's just a tad off, ooh, our stomach says, no, I don't know about that. We've got that kind of understanding to where we don't have to wait for somebody else to say whether that's right or wrong. We know it because we can feel it. We know the doctrine of God well enough that if something's off, we say, I don't think so. And we go check it out. We go check it out to be sure. We check it out for ourselves and make sure it lines up with God's word. Stand firm. And finally, mature Christians have hope. We have hope. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And so here we have hope in two areas. First, he called us to eternal glory. That's the hope of heaven. We may suffer a little while, but with our eyes on Jesus, we can look forward to hope. A certain future. He has overcome the grave, folks. We have hope. And then there's a hope in this life. He will restore you, it said, and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. He's going to turn it around for you. He's going to give you this. That's present hope for this life. The pain and the struggle and the difficulty that says He's going to deliver you from that. He's going to restore you. That's bringing wholeness. He's going to put your life back together. He's going to strengthen you, give you renewed energy and ability to stand. He's going to make you firm and steadfast. And that has the image of a foundation that is unshakable. That's what He says He's going to do. In other words, He's going to make us whole. He's going to make us mature. That's what He wants from us. He will help us develop these characteristics of maturity, submission, holiness, hum humility, trust, self-control, alertness, firmness, and hope to Him be the power forever and ever. Amen, He says. Amen. So, hey, I wonder if there's anybody here that could do a little business with God today. Anybody? It's a good time. And we're going to have communion here in a, in a second. Last week, we talked about the Jewish festival of trumpets. Remember that? We talked about Rosh Hashanah. It began last Sunday, and it lasts for 10 days. It's a time of introspection and repentance. And it leads up to Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. And that's the day where the sins of the people were atoned for by a sacrifice. So all over the world, Jews are in the middle of a period of repentance leading up to a celebration of atonement. Yom Kippur begins on Tuesday evening this week. And here's how Leviticus describes the Day of Atonement. It just says... This should be a lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourself, not do any work. Because on this day of atonement, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. Then, before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins. Being clean from all your sins. 
this was God's plan all along. Before Jesus, it was a day, a day a year, where there was repentance and a turning from it. And then the day of atonement where the sacrifice was made that covered the sin. This is his plan. And now we come and we celebrate his atoning work on our behalf. We celebrate that through the Lord's Supper. In his instructions about the Lord's Supper, Paul says this, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty. Guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. So I'd like for, to invite us to do that right now. To examine ourselves. So would you bow before the God of heaven right now? And we're going to take a few quiet moments to prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper. And so I'd ask you to quiet your heart, to listen to God's voice, ask Him to reveal anything that's not pleasing to Him. Maybe you already know what that is. Maybe He says something new to you. I'm going to ask you to confess it, to repent, to turn from it right now in your heart so that you can be free to celebrate that atoning work. So would you pray quietly now while Nicole plays? come to your table now we repent of the things in our lives that grieve you we want to come clean so that you can make us clean and so we call on the name of Jesus now the name under which all of heaven and earth will bow we call on that name we confess our sins and we accept your forgiveness. We know that the forgiveness comes only by your shed blood. And we celebrate that now, Lord. We celebrate the fact that you have called our name. You have written it in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you've called us to be your children. Help us, Lord, to live like that. And now, Lord, as we celebrate the, uh, the supper that you ask us to celebrate, help us to remember. Give us a clear message from you of what you want us to remember, Lord. Help us to remember what you saved us from. Help us to remember all the times that you've helped us. Help us to remember that you have a good plan for us. Help us to remember, Lord, it's all a part pray this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who we love. Amen. Amen. Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I am now passing on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he was under great stress, and yet he wanted to give us this. He took the bread. And he gave thanks. Because all good things come from heaven. He gave thanks. And he broke it. And he 
said, here is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember that I was broken for you. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's the detergent that washes away all the stains of sin. Do this. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of what I've done for you. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Do you remember what He's done for you? We proclaim His death because that atoning sacrifice covered our sin. Remember it. And so as we come and take the elements, I ask that you just have a remembrance moment, will you? Remember what He did for you. the king of my own be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh you my soul for you are good oh good oh you are good the king of my own be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my own be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song for you are good, 
Lord, you are good. We recognize your goodness today. We accept your sacrifice on our behalf, Lord. We thank you for the forgiveness of sin. Help us, Lord, to use what we remember to launch us into service for you. Help make us mature Christians, people that you can use, people that impact the world people that please you. We want to please our Father. And we thank you. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Hey, you guys have been awesome today. Thank you for your attentiveness. You guys know we've been in a series here on in First Peter. It's loosely titled Holiness. I've made an executive decision to extend that to one week and next week we're going to do second peter all of it okay so you got to read three whole chapters so that's your homework for next week we're going to read three whole chapters we'll be in chapter three but but look at the book and spend some time in it it'll be a blessing to you i promise you you got something you want to say okay so hey stan i'd like to give you a blessing And I hope you have a great week. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. The God who after you've suffered a little while will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be power ever and ever. Amen. Amen. You guys have a great, great week.